Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. I want to take a look at the top five most underrated composers, according to me. It's an entirely biased list. And actually, this list was originally 14 composers long. And I kind of just like, I chopped it down to my personal favorites. I tried to include a diverse mix of uh, European classical musicians. So there's a Czech composer on here. There's a Spanish composer, an Italian composer, a French composer, and a German composer. However, I didn't make a diverse list in terms of eras. So what you'll find is in this list, all of them are romantic or late romantic composers except for one. And again, that just kind of reflects my own personal bias, the kind of music that I enjoy listening to. But I also picked these composers because I feel like you genuinely, well, at least from what I see from your comments, you guys tend to like romantic music too. So I think you will genuinely enjoy these suggestions. At least that's my goal. So let's get started. Domenico Scarlatti is technically a Baroque composer. Uh, he was active in the early to mid 1700s, but his music was also leaning in the new classical direction, which would have been the mid 1700s to early 1800s. One of Scarlatti's biggest shortcomings is that he was born in the exact same year as two other really huge Baroque composers. So Handel and Bach were also born in 1685, and they definitely overshadow him. Because even nowadays, everybody knows of Bach, and um, Handel is still fairly well known even for people who aren't like super acquainted with classical music. But most people, unless you're a keyboardist, uh, don't know Scarlatti. Uh, he was really prolific. He wrote a whole bunch of serious operas, around 60 of them. He wrote liturgical pieces and other vocal works. But mainly what survives today of his works are his 555 keyboard sonatas. So if you've heard the name Scarlatti before, that in and of itself means that he's not entirely underrated, but what I think he is, is often overlooked. So for example, his most famous works, his 555 keyboard sonatas, are labeled sonatas, but they're actually nothing like classical sonatas by more famous composers like Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven. Because of this, I think there's like a genre classification issue. Um, people often, when they're looking for sonatas, will look at those really, really famous classical ones, and Scarlatti's just kind of tend to get ignored because they don't really represent the genre. I also think that as far as Baroque music goes, people tend to stick to like the cheery, intermediate level handle suites and um, of course everyone learns Bach and since those two composers more distinctly represent the Baroque era whereas Scarlatti represents more of a transitional period between the Baroque and classical periods he often gets overlooked because of that because he's not such a like clear-cut definitive Baroque guy. I really recommend you check out Horowitz's uh, Scarlatti Sonata. I think K87 is the one I have linked on the blog. Um, the, the clip I'm going to play for you isn't Horowitz, but it's still a very good recording of the same Sonata, and you can get a sense of his emotional style in this. Next up is Fanny Mendelssohn Hansel, when she married, who was the sister of the much more famous Felix Mendelssohn. I've talked about Fanny on the video where we discussed really awesome female composers, but I really wanted to bring her up again today because she, well, she was a German pianist and composer who lived in the first half of the 19th century. And I really do believe that had she been a man, she would have gone really, really far in life. I think one of the most impressive things about Fanny was her output. It's not like she was composing a piece here or there kind of on the side. She composed hundreds of works, same as any other serious man musician at the time. Second, some of the works she composed aren't even credited to her. So it's thought that she published some of her pieces under her brother Felix's name uh, in his Songs Without Words compositions. I'm including her because I think she's really truly underrated. I mean, it's even hard to find recordings and sheet music of hers, and her music is very good. My favorite composition by Fanny Mendelssohn is her song cycle called The Year, and it's basically a 
12 pieces and each piece represents a month of the year. The On the blog post, the one that I've specifically linked is called September. The whole cycle is about 45 minutes long, but uh, if you listen to just one of them, I really, really like September. It's very beautiful. I think it's called At the River and it's, uh, yeah, very virtuosic too. And then we have Charles Valentin Alkin, who I wouldn't have even heard of had it not been for a few really devout fans writing passionate comments on this channel. So thank you for the Alkin fans for bringing him to my attention. He was a French Jewish composer active in the Romantic era in Paris around the same time as Chopin and Liszt, and they were all acquainted with each other. So why care about Alkin? Well, first of all, Liszt himself was a big fan and he praised Alkin as well as uh, his piano technique and his compositions. He regularly performed in the same concerts as Liszt and Chopin when he wasn't being a hermit, which we'll talk about. Um, but one thing Liszt is quoted as saying is that Alkin possessed the finest technique he'd ever known, but preferred the life of a recluse. So that gives us our first significant insight as, as to why Liszt and Chopin are well known, but Alkin is largely forgotten. He would basically spend years years at a time eschewing public performances in favor of being alone, in favor of solitude. It's very telling that one of the only pictures you can find of him on the internet is taken from behind where you can't even see his face. If you want to know more about Alkin's backstory, we actually did an entire history video on him a while back. I think it's interesting, so check it out if you want to know more about this guy. Uh, but basically, with him, he had very little interest in promoting himself and his music. He was very reclusive. Since, because of that, he didn't perform as much as maybe some other guys did and he didn't really tour. So that when he died, people basically just forgot his name and his music was just kind of left by the wayside. Another problem with Alkin is that his music is extremely difficult. He was known for pushing the boundaries of piano technique and like it's basically just like a chosen few who can play Charles Alkin's music because of that. We don't know it as well. It wasn't picked up by hobbyists as often. Spanish composers and well basically any composer not from USA, Germany, Britain, Italy or France tend to get really overlooked in Western music. I didn't really come across Spanish composers in my music studies that I remember. It was honestly just like my own curiosity that led me to discover Isaac Albanese. And Albanese was active in the late 1800s towards the end of the Romantic era. And he's best known for his piano compositions, like his epic Iberia Suites, probably his best known work and one of the most challenging sets of pieces in piano repertoire ever. Um, and that's probably why I chose him as opposed to some of the other Spanish composers who we'll talk about in a moment, because I just really like piano music and that's my bias. A lot of Albanese's music has been transcribed to guitar and some of my absolute favorite recordings of his are performed on classical guitar. So I encourage you to check those out. I honestly can't give you a solid reason for, I have a few theories as to why Albanese isn't more popular. Um, I mean, it could be that his piano music, kind of like Alkin's, is very vir virtuosic and very challenging so that less people play it. But it's also very appealing music. Again, I find that Albanese is one of those guys that even non-classical music lovers can appreciate. And maybe like he didn't live a particularly long time. He lived to the age of 49. So I mean, maybe that's part of it, but I mean, a lot of composers died younger than 49 and left a significant mark, like say Schubert. So it's hard to say. There were a couple other influential Spanish composers around the same time as Albanese, notably Manuel de Falla and Enrique Granados, both who would have 
have been perfectly valid to be a part of this list. As I mentioned, I just happen to really like Albaniz. A part of it is his music is is list-like in its impressiveness. It's very virtuosic, but it's also immediately enjoyable for even the most casual of classical music listeners. Like I know people who enjoy Albaniz's guitar transcription music, um, but they don't listen to classical music. It's very appealing. Um, and part of the reason I think it's so enjoyable is because his music's largely based on Spanish folk music. And folk music, by nature, is really simple. If you think about what people listen to on the radio, like pop music and stuff, we tend to find like a natural appeal in simple music. My favorite Albanis is his Suite Española Opus 47, which contains my favorite piece, Asturias, as well as Granada. Um, Iberia Suite, as mentioned before, is also really amazing. If I'm remembering correctly, I'm pretty sure this is one of my picks from the video we did a while back of um, classical music for people who don't like classical music. I find it's super appealing and the version I have linked on the blog is the piano version but there's also really cool guitar transcriptions of this one that sounds like almost better. They're both good in their own ways though. Finally, we conclude this list with Antonin Dvorak. And most of you actually probably know the name Dvorak, so you're probably wondering why he made this list. My decision was based on the fact that he's rather unfairly a one-hit wonder to most people. Most people know the New World Symphony tune, or at least like a small little part of the tune, but most people don't know any other music by Dvorak. Dvorak was active in the later part of the 19th century and was a Czech composer. And like others in his era, he relied heavily on folk music in his writing. So again, why wasn't he more popular? I think one of the biggest reasons for this has to do with Brahms. Brahms was writing similar music at a similar time and Brahms was really successful. Dvorak's music was simpler and lighter than Brahms. And it, his music has been criticized as being superficial, not as deep. So Brahms was considered the more serious musician and they often got compared. Some of us music fans can fall into the trap of thinking that if music isn't gritty enough or if it isn't dark enough, then it's not music to be taken seriously. And there's such an optimism and lightness in Dvorak's music that it's easy to brush it off as being like kind of just trivial music, but I think that's a really unfair thing to do. I actually think that it's this inherent optimism in Dvorak's music that makes it interesting because historically at the time when Dvorak was writing music, people were writing these like crazy, dark, intense, big, dramatic pieces that were really complicated. And he focused on simple and light and clean and straightforward. So aside from his ninth symphony, the New World Symphony, uh, which is obviously performed a lot, his uh, seventh and eighth symphonies are also really well known, but his first six are totally as good and they're not as well known. And I'm not entirely sure why. Um, and actually the, the symphony that I'm gonna be linking to you on the blog is his sixth symphony, which is, uh, it has a likeness to Brahms music for sure, and you'll be able to hear that, but I think it stands on its own. You can take a listen to it. But in addition to composing those symphonies, Dvorak also composed string quartets and piano trios and operas, and a ton of other music that basically gets ignored nowadays. Like it's all but forgotten. He, he really, his symphonies are really the main things that are performed nowadays. And that is all for today's video. I hope I was able to share with you some maybe new music that you hadn't heard before that you can go and check out and enjoy. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all of you for commenting and liking and subscribing and I'll catch you in the next video.
Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. And I almost didn't say Piano TV, I don't know what I was gonna say. That loud truck is really distracting. 